welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Pixelated Sausage Show. Hi, 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 hi. How are y'all doing? I am, of course, your host, Mark Nez. Got some games to talk about, for sure. And I talked about giving my thoughts on the whole Xbox situation, situation on a Patreon exclusive little video or something along those lines, but I guess I'll just dump them here, which may come out, that is this podcast, this episode, after the Xbox podcast. So what I say will maybe all be a bunch of nonsense and you'll see how stupid I am. So I would also not frame what I am going to say as predictions of any sort, not educated predictions or based on rumor predictions, more so what I would do if I were in Xbox's shoes. And after that, after I get through all that, because I don't have that much to talk about or say about these games, I will be talking about Phantom Abyss, Knights of Braveland, Teppo and the Secret Ancient City, Mustache in Hell. I know my mustaches, and I'm going to hell for sure, so very apt game for moi. And then Genie Reprise. But we'll get to that in a little bit with my poofy hair that I just wish it would grow super fast and get to a length that I could do something with. Our pony... <laughs> Are ponytails... What do people think about ponytails? I know people always make fun of, fun of man buns, which... I guess I can see because of the people... Or the type of person people usually attribute to having a man bun, but... Fashionista speaking? Fashion... Fashionable? Speaking of fashion, or speaking of physical appearance, I, I don't think man buns actually look all that bad. So is it just... The type of person people attribute to man buns. <clears throat> <laughs> what about ponytails? Or what other ways are there to deal with hair when it's long other than a ponytail at a man bun and letting it all down for someone who is sexually male, genderly non-binary. <laughs> General, general, genderly, and generally. Anyway, Xbox. So, there's been a lot of doom and gloom, and people losing their mind over Xbox, as video game people like to do. And it, it got me thinking, too. PlayStation and Xbox fanboys, fans, whatever, a lot of ridiculous insane people on both ends and I'm sure there are those on the Nintendo side but I would more so think of Nintendo fanboys as just people who really like Nintendo they don't want to bother with other consoles or platforms they just like Nintendo Nintendo simps or whatever you want to call them but I have to imagine they're just sitting back watching all this stuff thinking Man, I'm glad I'm a Nintendo fan. Because I've been watching it and thinking, man, I wish I was a Nintendo fan. But in terms of Xbox, let's just go bullet by bullet. In terms of exclusive games, first party, second party as well. But games and how they'll handle multi-platform, multi-platform nature of them, that is. I think... All indie games, they're still Xbox games, so they're not really indie, but those smaller team games like Hi-Fi Rush, Pentiment, I believe Grounded is a small team, or it, it was made by a small team, and I'm assuming it's still supported by a small team wall. Rit? No, Grounded's Obsidian? Yes? And then see if these would be the rare game that they're continuing to cover, or... or, or support while working on 
rare wild but i don't know what that game is that oh who fucking knows but all indie games quote unquote indie games should either be time exclusive at a year or shorter even up to day and date and that may seem insane but i don't think no matter the quality of the games because critically both pentiment and i Five rush were very well received they were game of the years for some outlets for some people which is a lot that's a that's a big deal but i can't think of a single person especially with pentiment who looks at those games and says, I'm going to buy an Xbox for that game. They're not system sellers. So why not put them on as many platforms as possible to get them in as many eyes as possible so that people can play them, experience them, know that they're Xbox games and think, I really like this Xbox experience. What, what else could I get if I dabbled, if I joined the Xbox ecosystem? In terms of your big exclusives like Starfield, Indiana Jones, Blade, etc., I would keep those exclusive. And if they wanted to eventually put them on other platforms, console platforms that is, because every everything is console and then PC. PlayStation is the same way. Nintendo's the only console, console, console. Uh company out there i would wait until a game is at the end of its life and no longer being supported in a significant way outside of bug fixes or any uh, anything of that nature so when a game gets a complete edition or a game of the year edition or whatever when starfield's done with significant quality of life updates all the DLC that is planned is done and they're ready to move on to focusing development entirely on Elder Scrolls 6, for example. At that point, sure, put it on PlayStation. Why not? It'll give it a, 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 a new life. It'll put it into the zeitgeist again, however long after its initial release. And then with that as well, you are giving those new customers the best possible experience that they'll be able to get because you'll have iron out bugs, you'll have put in these quality of life things, you'll have all the DLC, etc. So they'll get the best possible experience of this game and that game. And then with your more Xbox centric titles and franchises like Gears of War, Halo, I would keep those games exclusive for the newer releases until a significant amount of time potentially generational jump uh, of time but while some have thought it's crazy to even consider putting something like the master chief collection or the gears what i would assume would be one two three i don't i don't think that collection is actually out yet it's just rumored but a collection of the first three Gears game, games on PlayStation, for example, I think that makes perfect sense because while those games are more so associated with Xbox than Starfield or Indiana Jones, if someone hasn't already purchased an Xbox for Halo or Gears, they're not going to, they're not going to do it. They've had plenty of time and plenty of opportunities. They're not going to do it. That barrier to entry is way too high for them. But if you put those games and these these legacy games, these older games, that'll give people an idea of what these franchises have to offer, that barrier to entry is greatly diminished. And then if they decide to try out Halo or Gears and find out they really like the way they play, the story, the characters, and want to continue playing the rest of the games that aren't on their platform, then they have to look at Xbox and say, well, do I get an Xbox? Do I get Game Pass on PC? Do I buy a la carte on PC? 
it, it, it basically gives people both the indie titles and these older titles it gives people a taste of what they can get on xbox in hopes that you get them to join the family because while i see the argument from phil spencer about losing the last generation xbox one ps4 as being the worst generation to lose because it's people creating their digital libraries it doesn't exactly make sense in my eyes because while it's true you're not going to get someone who has invested deeply into the playstation ecosystem digitally to convert to change over to an xbox fan there you 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 shouldn't be thinking about that as opposed to trying to get them to make xbox a part of their family in addition to playstation while sure there are plenty of people who can't afford all the consoles i think there are more people able and willing to buy multiple consoles if you give them a reason to so you shouldn't be trying to change a playstation fan into an xbox fan you should be trying to make a playstation fan into an xbox fan as well and you do that by giving them taste because you're, you're you're not going to just convert someone by saying hey we, we have these games you should you should want to play them you have to give them an idea give them a little taste get them addicted <clears throat> so that's how i feel about the whole exclusive front and look at this freaking poofy stupid hair in terms of them leaving the console market i don't think that makes sense at all i talked about this last episode i believe where it just it, it doesn't make sense in that that is the greatest avenue for game pass that is the biggest space for game pass and without it game Pass is very it would it would be significantly smaller in terms of its user base but i do think you had you had the leak with the delightfully digital or whatever it was all digital xbox series x essentially that people made fun of just for the wording mostly i could see xbox and i wouldn't be surprised if they went all digital given the poor sales of physical for the console that we know of it makes sense and why i think it makes sense as well is because the rumors about a new generation or a generational leap of xbox in 2026 as well as rumors of a steam deck like device i think it makes sense for them to really embrace their windows their pc roots and at least with them maybe playstation will get around to doing this as well later but it makes sense for them to kill the idea of generational jumps where it's just after a certain amount of time you come out with a new console that's more powerful and after a certain amount of time certain consoles become unable to play the newest games and how you remove the confusion of little billy's mom going to a store and buying a game that says the same console that they have but it's or the new one only and they have the the original is by making the console digital only where you go to the store to buy a game and it's grayed out the purchase button is grayed out because your console is too old to play that particular game and i think of it in a way that the only difference now between a playstation 5 pro and a xbox series x2 whatever they would call it Xbox Series X 2026 edition is wording, is semantics. That I could see happening, but we still might be a little too far away from that. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if they would still offer an option for physical media via uh, an external drive, but I don't think it would be a modular thing that you can attach to the Xbox. It would be more PC traditional of an 
external drive, that is. And then with a handheld, I think that just makes... The market shows that people like handhelds with the Steam Deck success, the Switch success. So a Steam Deck-like device with a dock, you can hook it up to the TV. Makes perfect sense. And I would be so over that. I, I, I would be all over it. But I also think what would make that particular device very tantalizing, especially because we have rumors of PlayStation thinking about doing the same thing. But if they could, if, if PlayStation is working on something similar and Xbox is working on one, if they can get it out significantly before PlayStation gets out their potential rumored Steam Deck-like device, I think that is Xbox's greatest chance of making a dent in the Japanese market. Do I think it means they're going to overtake PlayStation? No. I don't think there's a chance of Xbox making that big a... I said a dent. I didn't say they're going to crack or break or shatter the market. They're just going to... Potentially. It's all hypothetical, but I think that would be the best way to potentially make some kind of dent in that market and if that were to happen that would be great for xbox gamers in all markets because then you'd have more japanese publishers and developers seeing xbox as a viable platform to put their games out on because I, I i would like to see edf games on xbox again nis games on xbox give me a fucking nis game for the love of god outside of our type yeah, they're probably. I, I hate that they just put R type on there. Why don't they shouldn't have even done that? It, it annoys me because that shows they clearly know Xbox is a thing, and they're just like, hey, Xbox people like shooting things. Here's our this is our closest thing to a shooter. Here you go. All right, thanks, thanks a lot. But I think that would make sense. And then, what other points are there really to talk about? Any doom and gloomy. I, I I I feel like there's one other point I wanted to mention, but it's escaping me. Hmm. <laughs> so I guess we'll we'll get on to what I've been playing. Unless I can think about it before I, I, I talk about that. Xbox, Xbox, Xbox. <laughs> also I have more I, did I say that I I have more games in my Xbox library than most people. So I feel like I'm I'm pretty I'm a pretty appropriate person to talk about this as someone who is very invested in the Xbox ecosystem. Even though I would never say I'm an Xbox fan per se. Which is which is to say if I were to get a tattoo of a video game company first and foremost would be Sega except the only thing I could think of Sega wise would be the Sega logo and I can't think of a good place to put that. And then second after that would be PlayStation and specifically PlayStation 2. I love the PlayStation 2 logo. I love the PlayStation 2. PlayStation 2 is my favorite system. PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, I was all about PlayStation. And I was ready to be all about them moving forward. But the PlayStation 3, I've talked about it before, but there, there's so many... It, it 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 was Sony getting too cocky, and there there is concern about that. If depending on how Xbox handles all this, where PlayStation looks at all this and says, "Hey, we don't have to worry about shit," and they they do things that aren't great because no one's there to compete with them. But then you also have this report that came out about no big titles for this year until what spring of 2025 and I guess their stock dropped the most it's dropped in a very long time because of that news but I think all this just goes to show that you know, and with PlayStation the, the the budgets the time of development for their games is too long too expensive and whether or not they can cut that back or people just expect that kind of game from them 
that if they were to tone things down, people would be just... Uh, the video game space is in this very, very weird... I, I th There are so many reasons to love gaming and then so many reasons to be concerned about... It, it, it's a very volatile time for gaming. But that's enough about all that. Let us get on to what I've been playing, starting with Phantom Abyss. Phantom Abyss is a first-person tomb platforming game where you go through these tombs, avoiding traps while phantoms of other real-life players are doing the same thing, which is the gimmick of the game. If a phantom dies by a trap, that trap is disabled. I think you can turn that off in the settings, though. But you're just going through these tombs of varying numbers of levels, collecting gold as you do it, and keys that you can use for permanent upgrades. It's a, it's rogue light-ish in that sense. And your goal is to get through the tombs to the very end to collect relics that you will use to unlock this giant guardian or something as you progress further and further and using the keys that you obtain through these tombs and new whips, they, you have whips that ha have different attributes like healing you if you stand in water for, co uh, for gold in exchange for gold, giving you a double jump while also having shrines that you can spend gold during a run to gain temporary perks for that run like a double jump, no fall damage, etc., and other alternative shrines that will heal you or, or give you some kind of buff for that particular run. And it's all fine. The whip allows you to grapple at certain points and reach ledges you wouldn't be able to otherwise. You have a dash and some of the permanent upgrades are allowing your whip to reach further, dash further, remove the or slow, limit the cooldown on the dash. And the game visually has a very overblown, blown out color palette that I don't, it sometimes looks okay, but sometimes it, it can be a bit much. But it plays well, and as far as first person platforming goes, it feels all right. The problem I had, at least early on, which is where I am, is that I don't find it all that challenging. The tombs aren't super challenging. There's not the the sense of danger really isn't there. Exploring them to find hidden chests doesn't feel worth it. And I notice a lot of phantoms not even bothering with that. It's also I, I tried finding an option to turn off the phantoms, but it didn't seem to be there, or maybe I just missed it, didn't know where exactly in the settings it was. But I find the cluttered nature of the gameplay because of all these phantoms all over the place, because you'll, you'll go on runs and it'll start with six, seven, eight hundred, maybe twelve hundred phantoms still there, and you'll see that number dropping as you keep going further and further as these phantoms are dying off and these phantoms aren't live players because you can pause the game which is nice I, I like that you can pause the game that's always appreciated so these are just stock phantoms and who knows how many are actually real because they're not <laughs> based on the names I'm seeing in a lot of cases they're not gamer tags they're just these randomly generated names so I don't I don't even know how many phantoms are actually real people or what is exactly going on because the way a lot of phantoms behave is questionable. But they don't, outside of that trap aspect, really offer much of anything. I've come across shortcuts that you have to pay to open up, but it's not like I ever came across a shortcut in, in the few times I've, in, in the little bit I played where it was already open. I had to pay every time. And I don't know if that opened it up for other phantoms or how it works. That That's what I would assume, but that wasn't the case. So there's there's not much benefit 
to them outside of maybe in some cases, which I think is people uh, one of the things people talked about with Super Mario Wonder, where they might lead you to a chest that you wouldn't have found otherwise. But chests usually aren't that hard to find or, or that outside of your, your main path. So just... And the whip feels okay too, but you have to pull the left trigger to use it so that it will attach to a ledge. You can't just be running and looking at a ledge and then swinging your your whip. You can swing it without aiming to destroy pots for gold. But if you're just looking and just jumping and you hit a ledge with it, that won't that won't attach you to it and then pull you towards it, which I think is a weird choice and makes the fluidity of platforming a little less than it could be. But it's okay, it's okay. The problem is while it's not platforming based, I couldn't help but think, and this is a game that I'm pretty sure a lot of people forgot ever came out it's a game I constantly think about because I really enjoy it and I want to go back to it for a chat at the backlog at some point. But City of Brass, which is a rogue light, but more traditional where you're going from area to area, taking on enemies, finding secrets, finding gold that you can use, getting into boss fights. It's way more co combat centric. It's more so like City of Brass is more so like Spelunky, but in first person. And if that sounds cool to you, I highly recommend checking it out. The Phantom Abyss is more platforming based and it just is, it's okay. I didn't hate my time with it, but it, it didn't make me wanna, it's not something I'm dying to go back to and play, but I'll probably play some more because it, it's it's easy enough. Then Knights of Brave Land is a beat em up that I was initially excited about because it has a very cute cartoony art style reminiscent of Castle Crashers and that's what I thought the experience was going to be like but I don't know if the game has mobile roots but it feels very much like a mobile game one it's a $20 game that has $34 in microtransactions in the form of additional characters to play as which seems a bit much I think you have four or five unlocked with the base game and then six or so six or eight be a DLC. But that's not a real big deal. The big the bigger problem is the way the game is structured. It is also rogue lighty in that you have these bosses that are attributed to each area and you go through uh, a handful of sort of the way stuff like Slay the Spire and, and those deck building games are structured. Where you find these paths, sometimes there'll be branching paths that might lead you to a store or a campsite to rest or a combat scenario or some kind of random encounter that may give you a perk or give you some damage. And you're doing all this, and then when you get into combat, it's just an arena fight, single screen, no scrolling. I don't I don't remember any screen that was scrolling outside of a trap room that scrolled for maybe a foot extra screen real estate. But you just take on a dozen, maybe two dozen enemies, and then it's over. So it, it feels very shallow. You, when you complete a run, whether you fail or succeed, all of your goods, your gold, and stuff that you didn't spend will be converted to supplies that you can then use for permanent upgrades, like attack damage, stuff, just the typical thing. But the actual gameplay, the way it's structured, is very, very shallow. With each additional movement on the map as you're making your way to the boss, it costs one food supply. So you have to make sure you keep that in check. You can purchase that or earn some more via random encounters or through stores. And, and, and the gameplay itself, too, is just very, very 
easy so far, at least on the normal difficulty, which is the highest difficulty unlocked at the very start of each area. It's easy and casual, whatever the, the lower difficulty is. So it's not that challenging, which is unfortunate because it, it plays relatively well. You have a basic attack, you hold it for a strong attack, and a special attack that varies from whatever item you picked up that you can find new ones during a run. You don't keep them, that they'll always be random. That uses energy that you gain back by attacking people with your basic attack. In the comment, all that feels good, but enemies are pretty weak. They're pretty stupid. All the regular enemies, their attacks, their animations are canceled every time you hit them. So they're not hard to deal with. Bigger enemies telegraph their attacks very obviously. And you have a role that allows you to get out of the way of attacks very easily. Even with bosses, they telegraph stuff and give you enough time to get out of the way. So bosses don't pose much of a challenge. They're just spongier. So they take more attacks to, to take down. So it's just a very, very overall shallow experience that you can play co-op with up to three other people. So it's co-op up to four people. I don't know if there's online co-op. I didn't, I didn't look into that. But it, it, it's just so shallow that I could see it working on Switch, on Switch, or even Steam Deck as a handheld experience. But if you're sitting down at your TV and you want to play something that has some kind of significance, it's not, it's not nice at Brave Land, sadly. But then we have Teppo and the Secret Ancient City. This is a platformer where you're going through these surprisingly long levels, having to collect all the gems in order to complete them and go through the portal. The story revolves around you learning about some ancient civilization that was more advanced than the Mayans or any of the other ones in the rainforest, deep in the rainforest that had technology through some kind of alien means and you're collecting these gems to unlock portals to new worlds new locations but the the levels are very long and involve a decent amount of backtracking which can get frustrated and tedious very quickly what's nice is that instead of having your typical checkpoints for levels you have save points, which are save points. You quit out the game, close it entirely, reopen it. You'll start at that save point. So you don't have to start over a level if you're halfway through and want to take a break. If you, if you reach a save point, you're good. But that doesn't stop the long nature of levels from feeling tedious and feeling like it would be better if they were, if they were broken up into shorter levels. But the the platforming is is okay. Visually it's a bit blurry and it doesn't look that great. You initially you can take on enemies, you can drop on them, you can jump on top of most of them to not kill them, but knock them out. They get knocked out into a ball of light or something that when you move far enough away from them, they'll resurrect, which is a weird system. But you also get weapons that you can use for various means. Uh, I think a boomerang, a gun, and uh, I don't know if it was a whip. But those... Eh. It just... It's like, oh, I thought this... I thought, I thought the game would maybe have something a little more special going for it, but it didn't. Then Mustache and Hell is a twin six shooter with a bit of a original gauntlet structure in that it's top down twin six shooter. You're going from these rooms and there are locked doors all over the place. And then you will come across and find keys that you can use to unlock doors. You can decide which door you want to go in some cases. Sometimes there'll only be one that you open. And you're just making your way through these levels. 
where you are the whatever death has you by the balls you're almost dead but he can get your life back if you help him collect this crap that somebody stole his his, his former right hand man stole a bunch of shit and he wants you to get it back because you got a mustache and you were in the military or something it's like you, you can handle it yourself so you're going from room to room opening doors and occasionally getting into rooms that are basically arenas themselves to continue down that path and you take on waves of enemies there might be mini bosses there might be actual bosses there might be situations where you have to defeat these bigger enemies to stop the waves of normal enemies coming in and while you're in these arenas you have your basic pistol but at random intervals maybe every minute or so a random weapon like a submachine gun or a shotgun will spawn in as well as an item like a mine or a grenade it's perfectly fine structure wise but the gameplay is very very dull and the shooting doesn't feel good and in twin six shooter if the shooting doesn't feel good it's not going to be a good time and it's not a good time that's mustache and hell then genie reprise i bounce off of very quickly because what the game seems to be is one very pretty i was surprised by how pretty the game was i i, I looked at the visuals and i thought man this looks way nicer than i was expecting i'm excited and then the story started to chime in and it was this very poetic, flowery, somewhat pretentious. Just I didn't care at all about what it was selling me story-wise. And then I came to realize, at least in the first area and seemingly the start of the second area, it starts off each area with you collecting a bunch of stones to fill your gemstone meter. And then when that happens, you'll unlock a bunch of little platforms in the area that you stand on top of and then have to find the light and stare into it. And after you do that for a few seconds, you'll get a story dump. And then you do that about eight or 10 more times in the area, just getting more story and more story and more dialogue. And then you move on to the next area. Maybe things change up. I can't really say definitively that that's all the game is. But the start of the secondary had me collecting the stones again. And it seems like that's what it wants. And that's too bad because I think there is a very pretty game there that I wish was more than just a pretty game. Even though the, the visuals very well could be just common assets or, or, or a lot of reuse assets, it, whatever, it, it, it looks good. That's it. It looks good. I like the way it looks. And I wish I liked the way it played. I wish I liked what the game actually was. But I just like it on a visual sense. Sadly, 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 sadly. That is again, though, Genie Reprise. And that's it for what I've been playing and all that jazz. And that will do it, obviously for this year episode of the pixelated sausage show once again i am marcus nez y'all can find me pretty much everywhere at px sausage if you enjoy this here show or any of the stuff i do and what have you you can support me and my nonsense over at patreon.com slash px that's a little brain fart there i was thinking about the fact that i'm considering returning to streaming because i think mentally it could be good for me I i'm thinking about a lot of different things I can maybe do in, in addition, as well as slowing down on Attack the Backlog releases instead of doing them every other week and having other content, maybe bringing back not, what was it? That, that, that series I did where I, I played a game for the first whatever hour or so and then I gave my first impressions it might have just been called first I think it was called first that's what it's called it's called first I think Sonny liked that show 
and others may have liked it as well. But maybe having those come back, having streams, and then giving myself time to really play the games I really want to play for Attack the Back. There are a lot of ideas percolating in my head. And we'll see. But again, if you do enjoy any of the stuff I do and what have you, support is greatly appreciated. And if you would like to support me and my nonsense again, that is patreon.com slash pxs. In addition to the Patreon, you can find links to the site, the YouTube, the Discord, and so much more over at patreon.pxsausage.com. Yeah, forget about Patreon. I mean, don't forget about Patreon. But in terms of all the links, that's pxsausage.com. But that is it. That is all. As always, thank you for watching or listening. I hope you enjoyed this here episode, and I hope you have both a wonderful rest of your day, a lovely rest of your week. I hope if you are an Xbox fan, you're not one of the crazies, though I don't know how many real crazies are out there and just people looking for hits. I say, oh, Moses, I sold all my shit. You know, it be funny. I, I was saying this too. It would be hilarious if they came out and said, Actually, we've, we've did, done a hard reverse on what you were expecting. Minecraft, we're taking that off of PlayStation, Nintendo. It, it's, it's Xbox exclusive now. We're, not, we're taking it off PC as well. The only place to play Minecraft is on your Xbox, so you better fucking buy an Xbox. If, if you like Minecraft, if you like Minecraft that much, you better fucking buy an Xbox. I'm sure that would go over very well. It also reminded me, another game I think would make so much sense going other platforms specifically in Nintendo you put on PlayStation as well but rare replay my god i i don't know if that would sell ridiculously well on Nintendo but i feel like man and they should do something with it where it's hey Nintendo we'll put rare replay on the switch let us put online play in fucking golden eye <laughs> fucking weirdos why is it's so stupid just give us online play. God damn it. But again, that is it. That is all. As always, thank you for watching or listening. I hope you enjoyed this here episode. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, a lovely rest of your week, and a wonderful weekend. But for now, adios. Arrivederci. Bye. time.